for the Potomac chapter of the Virginia Native Plant Society. Please welcome Alonzo. Well, thank you folks. I, I, I certainly appreciate being in here and I love being able to at least see people if only virtually. So um, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. And um, again, um, I won't be able to see or, or see what uh, be able to answer questions until the end. But again, good seeing everybody, at least for now. So, so if you guys can see that, I am going to go ahead and start my presentation. Uh, again, this is uh, talking about the interconnectedness of things and oops, for whatever reason, I can't seem to advance my, not advancing for me. And we do four and I was able to do it. So not quite sure why you can't advance it. Let me, let me, I'm sorry, let me stop sharing this and, and try that again. can't seem to actually okay let me I'm sorry let me try that again I apologize I'm not quite sure why it did not I am having some difficulties I apologize we know this was working a little while ago this is I know it's just this is kind of, of a weird thing it doesn't seem to want to enter full screen. Okay, so can you guys see that? Yep. All right, fine, I can finally get it going. I apologize. Okay, folks, so without further ado, again, I do encourage you guys to follow me on Capital Naturals and a variety of different social media. Here are some of them, uh, some of the ways that you can do that. And again, let's go ahead and continue with the presentation. And again, the presentation is how everything fits together. And I've done several different presentations on this. And since this one will focus on native plants and so forth. Um, so most of us, when we went to school, we usually thought about, you know, how things kind of fit together, think about a food chain, one thing eats another and so forth and so on. And then we found that, that that was really so simplistic that it really did not seem to work. So then we started talking about things like food webs and this and that, and even that as interconnected as it is, almost like a spider web where you pull on one string and it kind of affects everything else, even that just does not, uh, that does not really uh, capture everything that's there. So what I'm going to explain is just a couple of very, very simple things that will hopefully open up you to uh, looking at so many other um, interesting connections that there are in the natural world. So uh, one of the big things that we usually think uh, we think about from the great naturalist John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that is so, so true, as you will see. So here we have a lichen, and there's an old saying, uh, something to uh, something that that many different naturalists try to, uh, to 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 remember. It's when an algae takes a lichen to a fungus, and um, when you do this, you put the two things together, you come up with a completely new thing. The fungus and the algae have a symbiotic relationship and then with this brand new thing, uh, what is called a lichen. Um, now we found out that there's actually even more than that. So anobacteria is sometimes evolved as well. But if you take any of these pieces out, you never have the complete whole of what is a lichen. They exist together and you, they, it, the only way they can do that is by being connected with their, with their partner. And this is true with so many other things. So for example, we find out that about 90% of the world's plants have a positive association with fungi and 80% of them cannot survive at all. They need these fungi. Many of them are called mycorrhizal fungi. They use them, they have them on their roots. And what it does is it extends, um, it extends their root pattern and allows them to, to basically share something with the, with, the, with the fungi itself. And it's so incredibly important. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons that many of the plants don't do as well when we put them back into a new place. You replant it and sometimes they need to make these connections. And if the proper um, you know, mycorrhizal fungi and stuff is not there, it does make a big difference and affects how uh, the plant or whatever is starting to grow. So we look at one of the example of this. This is a, a yellow lady slipper, and uh, this is something that that we found out is very connected with uh, with certain species of, of fungi. If you remove the fungi, ye the yellow lady slipper or any uh, any of the uh, lady slippers just cease to exist. And this is true of many orchids. This is why if people go out there and they dig up this uh, this plant. Um, it 
oftentimes disconnects it from the fungi that, that it depends on. And when you take it home, it doesn't survive very well. And um, I, it's very unfortunate because people say, oh, what a beautiful plant that can take it home. But when you do that, you separate it from its connections. And again, without those connections, these things cannot exist. And 90 some percent of, um, of lady slippers that are dug up from an area, even if you're very careful and get as much soil as you can, they fail because they need the, the interconnectedness with the fungi. And when you disconnect that, you destroy both the fungi and the lady slipper. So again, this is something that people are working on and please uh, be very cautious about how you, if you ever purchase these kinds of things, because many of them, particularly lady slippers, really are too difficult to raise in captivity. And even if you buy it, it might be very difficult to, to transfer. So again, just one example of how uh, fungi and plants are so linked together. But things get much more complicated. So here we have, uh, we've already talked about how fungi and, and plants are, are uh, connected together. Then we find out that th there's these things that kind of cheat on this, what they call mycorrhizal cheaters. So when people first saw, for example, a beach drops on the lower left, well, they said, oh, how cool. This is always found near beech trees. And they assumed, oh, it's, it's either parasitic or symbiotic with beech trees. And then they found that it's actually never that simple. It actually is a menage a trois, if you will. It actually needs the fungi. It actually uh, feeds off the fungi that needs the beech drops. And so you, you have all three of them together to have a beech drop. You have to have the beech tree, then you have the, 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 uh, the, the fungi that it so much needs, and you need then the beech drop to be in just the right place to be able to access the fungi and take uh, things from them. And this is true of all sorts of different things, pine saps close to pines, Squaw roots and Indian pipes close to several different trees, but especially oaks and beaches and fall coral root. Um, all of these things, um, actually, people used to think uh, were, were parasitic or whatever the case may be. But in reality, they're actually uh, basically robbing what they can from the fungi. And it's an amazing thing. The only problem with all of this is um, when you do that underground, um, you do need every once in a while to come up above the ground in order to get pollinated and spread your seeds. And that's the only thing that we notice. We don't notice all of the things that are going underground. But when they send up these flowers, and some of them are, are very unique looking, that is what we notice. And again, um, it, it's interconnected on three different things. And you looked at mistletoe and it's kind of interesting too. It's a hemiparasite. So it actually gets connected to the tree and it uses, it's parasitic on that and to get its nutrients, but it's still green. So it actually, um, so it actually does use this. Um, so it, it, it basically uses the tree to get some nutrients, but it can um, also photosynthesize. And that's very, very different, I think, from the mycorrhizal cheaters. But it's still parasitic, it actually needs, uh, needs trees in order for it to get above the ground and get to the light that it, that it so much needs. And mistletoe is, is just one example of one of these. Again, how it depends on trees to get to wh where, it, where it needs to be. So we are talking about natives and I wanted to show just some of the reasons why we use natives. And again, you have to remember that um, these things have, have evolved with all the different animals. And because of that, they're preferred by native, native wildlife because that's how they evolved. Um, many of you guys are master gardeners and everybody knows the mantra, right plant, right place. That is the case. These things are adapted to different areas and it's amazing um, just how um, uh, if you pick the right plant, you, um, you can find the right plant for almost every, di every different condition that you have. And there's so many to choose from. There's over 1,700 native species just in, in Northern Virginia. We are in a very rich part of, 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 of the country. We're at the southern limit of many southern animals and plants. We're at the northern limit of a lot of the, 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 the southern an, um, animals and plants. We're close to the shoreline so we can get uh, some of the coastal types of things. And the rivers and stuff brings down uh, things from the mountains. So because of that, we have a whole array of amazing things to look at. Uh, it's a great place to be a naturalist because you, you have so many different connections of, 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 of the southern limits, northern limits of these kinds of things. And we're also in a major flyway. So tons of different things here and it all uh, depends on the plants and so forth. So uh, many of them are, are attractive and many of them have multiple uses. Some of you guys may have planted things. I know I have, you know, service berries and things like that, native strawberries. Why? Because I not only um, I can eat them, but they also serve another value. Service berries are beautiful to look at and so forth. And then something else. Um, you have to remember that insects lay a ton of eggs, but they need the native plants to do this. And about half of the insects feed on plants, but of that 
of the insects that feed on plants, 90% of these are specialists. They need a certain um, genus or family of plants in order to survive. A lot of people talk about pests, but the, uh, you have to remember that with the native plants and the native, uh, and the native animals, they're very specialized. And so this is something we don't have to worry about as much. Much of the insects that are out there are, are, are something that really um, are not a huge thing because if these things that evolve with them were to kill the only host plant that they need, that is a very poor strategy for evolution. Why would you want to kill the only thing that you need? And so these things have evolved together. And um, as long as we don't introduce non-native things, that they, it functions pretty well. So let's look at this. And we find that 96% of land birds feed their young caterpillars and sawflies as well. That is the food source. It's a protein packet. And you have to remember also all of our 17, and some people say 18 because there's one more bat that they've added to this, they feed on insects. And so it's incredibly important to realize that the native plants support this huge variety of, of food for a ton of other animals, whether you're birds and bats. And that's so, in, that's so important to realize realize you need these things and not only that but they also feed um, a ton of different birds you have to remember that that might be one of the reasons why we have um, you know migration they leave here not so much because they can't handle the cold but because they lack they started to lack their food um, there aren't any insects for them to eat or very few of them but they fly all the way back here why because they time it so that it's just the right time when they can feed on the brand new insects which are born thanks to the native plants so here we have a Talamese chart, and this is really, really old. For example, oaks on the left-hand side, Quercus, it actually supports much more than, I think it's 557, but it's a ton of different things um, that, you, that you can plant. And look at the um, amount of insects, um, I should say caterpillars that support. And remembering that caterpillars are the main source of food for all of our, for 96% of our, of, our, uh, of our nesting birds, it's incredibly important to plant these uh, native plants. And this is something that uh, Doug Tallamy um, is, is, of course, uh, been promoting in both his, uh, in, in a variety of his books, starting with Bringing Nature Home. And again, you can sustain wildlife by planting plants. And then, of course, Nature's Best Hope, he talks about some other things, about uh, how important certain key species are and, and, and certain things that people can do to help wildlife by simply changing the way or adding some additional things to your yard. And I can't wait, uh, coming out right now is gonna be the nature of oaks. And I'm gonna have the great honor of, of, of uh, co-hosting uh, Doug, uh, Doug Tallamy on the, on the Native Plant Podcast. And again, I can't wait to get this book that's uh, being sent to me and I can't wait to learn more from him. But again, a lot of the things that I borrowed and ideas are thanks to Doug Tallamy. And again, there's some fantastic things to realize, but it all comes down to native plants. So here's another example, something so simple as a, a Carolina chickadee, very, very common all over. But here's the thing, though, in order to raise one brood of three young, they need over 9,000 caterpillars to feed them. And what do those caterpillars need? They need native plants. And so they found out that if you don't have 70% native biomass, you cannot get chickadees, uh, chickadees to survive in your yard. It's, it's amazing when you don't have, you have less than 70% uh, native plants, um, they, uh, they just don't support enough to feed chickadees. And bird feeders aren't the answer. In fact, in one of the studies that was done right nearby in Baltimore, they found out that some of the birds that were desperate for food fed, uh, tried to just feed their young bird seed. And unfortunately, they found the young dead in their nests with their crops full of bird seed, because guess what? Bird seed is not what they need. What you really want to feed the birds and attract them, you got to grow native plants. And when you do, um, when you do, and you reach over to 70%, then you have enough that you can support chickadees and have them really survive. So 70%, we know, is at least a magic number for Carolina chickadees. We don't know that much for others, but it's important to realize Native plants means you, you feed the birds and all sorts of wildlife. So a quick comparison. So here are the native, uh, the native plants on the right. And then you look to the, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, on the left and you look to the right and you have some very, very common um, plants that are planted. And look at the stark difference in how many uh, things are really supported by native plants, contrasting how very, very few 
are supported with a lot of the common things that we plant. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's kind of mind mind boggling. But a lot of the plants that people really want to plant uh, to plant out there support no wildlife. Look at daylilies, very very common all over, and we'll soon start seeing them in the, in the spring. But guess what? They support no caterpillars, and therefore they compete and take up space of something that could be supporting wildlife. So again, just one example of uh, how much superior native plants are to non-natives. So then, uh, you know, Talamy talks about keystone plants, and he found that the only that five percent of the genera hosted about seventy to 75% of the local caterpillars. And that's important because caterpillars are what's feeding the birds and the bats. So um, these are just some examples of them. You know, These are uh, plants that really support a ton of different things, whether it's willow uh, that also supports sawflies, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's asters, um, cherries, goldenrods. These are keystone plants that if you, you know, I know we're limited in space and so forth, but if you want to attract the most wildlife and be a, a good neighbor to the wildlife that's out there, you don't have to uh, plant everything. But when you plant these keystone species, that is what really benefits wildlife. And again, uh, Talamy uh, talks about the homegrown national park. He said that if, uh, if most people planted native plants on their properties, we would have much more, much bigger park, uh, national park than anything that's in existence today. But again, um, it doesn't take, you don't have to plant a ton of different kinds of native plants. It's great if you do, but if you concentrate on these keystone plants, some of the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned up above here, uh, you know, on the left, that's important. But uh, these keystone plants support everything else. And so, uh, again, it's great to plant natives, but if you're limited in space, you have to pick up what to plant. The keystone plants are the things that you need to look at. And we kind of mentioned some here. Um, just look at one example. So you look at an oak, which is very, very common, although you know some of them are, are in decline these days. And look at the tons of numbers of pork across North America. Over 40 mammals feed on it, over 60 birds, 61 wood boring beetles, 21 leaf hoppers, 550 gall wasps, most of them are cinnipid wasps, which forms these galls, some of them very specific to certain species of oaks. 557 caterpillars and 37 tree hoppers. So when you have an oak in your yard, it is one of these keystone plants and it supports a ton of wildlife. And so we need to protect these, uh, these plants as much as we can and encourage planting them because as you see, lots of things depend on these, all right? So these are of course, what you consider Lepidoptera host plants and there's tons of different examples, but when you plant them, lots of people plant them thinking, oh, I'm only gonna support caterpillars. And that's great because that feeds again, as I mentioned, most of, most of the birds and most of the bats. But it's much more than that because when you plant it, you may be planting, for example, milkweed to attract, um, you know, monarchs, but it's not just monarchs that you're attracting. When you look at this, you find that there's about 12 different kinds of, of, um, of Lepidoptera and butterflies and moths that feed on it, along with a variety of different beetles, as you see here, many of the, um, many different kinds of of, of, of bugs and so forth. So yes, it's true. You planted it maybe because you wanted to be a good neighbor and wanted to attract monarchs. But in reality, many other things benefit from your choices of what you choose to plant in your yard. And again, that's uh, my message here is if you go native, you really will be supporting a lot of different things. And there's a ton of beautiful, beautiful plants out there that are natives that are not just pleasing to the eye, but very pleasing to the appetites of all the different kinds of wildlife that are out there. And you don't have to worry about these destroying your plants or things like that because they evolve together. And as I mentioned, it's a very poor idea uh, for these things to kill what the only thing that they need to survive. So again, let's go on to something a little bit more and people talk about pollinators and it's true, about 75% of, flower, of flowering plants need some kind of animal to move them from one place to another. And we depend on this because, you know, 72% of our agricultural crops are pollinated by bees and other types of things. So folks, these are very important and we, we, if, you know, we want to try to attract these things because they're so important to us. So it's kind of a neat type of thing because I talk about uh, connectedness of stuff. And this is one of those things. Um, pollinators actually learn things. So if they come to a plant, they get some nectar and pollen from there. And guess what? 
they realize this is how, what I need to survive. And then they look, and once they, they found out that this is the plant that they want to they want to use, they then look for that similar plant over and over again. And that's incredibly important because you don't want, for example, here's you know, here's a coneflower, um, a, 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 a green coneflower. But here's the thing though, you don't want um, the the pollen of this plant ending up in a different species. That doesn't help the plant at all. So the plant benefits because it provides a certain number of, 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 of benefits as far as pollen and nectar to the pollinators. The pollinators learn about this and then they seek the exact same plant over and over again. That benefits the plant because the pollen goes to the right place and it benefits the, uh, the, the, uh, the pollinators because they know exactly what kind of reward they're getting from every plant that they visit. And whether it's a bee, a butterfly, even hummingbirds, they form these roots and they, they're very good about doing it. So this benefits both of them and it's another interconnectedness of nature. The pollinators knowing which plants and going to the right plants when they need to. So again, some basics about if you wanted to do a pollinator garden and again, uh, and again, they can be a little bit variable, but again, try to avoid herbicides and pesticides. Uh, you want to plant for continuous blooms. And that's a big problem with agriculture right now because it's if you plant it in only blooms during one time uh, of the year, then what do these animals feed on for the rest of the year? And mass plantings, it's so much easier for a pollinator that's flying by to see a bunch of flowers together rather than looking for one here and there. It benefits both the pollinator and the plant to do this. And they want to include host plants and not just because they feed one thing, but many. Basking sites are something since most insects are cold-blooded, they need a place that they can warm up. For butterflies, puddling areas, these little mud areas are very important to them. Um, again, you can, the sunniest location you have is the best place to do a pollinator garden. Now, granted, there are some things that, 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 that do well in the shade and so forth, but for maximum uh, benefit uh, to the pollinators, it's better to have a sunny location. And color and shape, okay? A, a lot of these different pollinators prefer, for example, groupings of plants. Um, they prefer certain colors. Uh, for, for many of them, it's blue and white. Uh, red is a poor color for bees and insects, but great for uh, things like hummingbirds. So again, all of these things are, are things that you uh, can think about when you're planning out your pollinator garden. And again, double flower petals, a lot of times they, um, they basically sacrifice one thing to get the extra petals and so that's not useful. And then if you possibly can, try not to uh, use cultivars or nativars. Um, most of them have never been tested. And if they have, it's very few to have been tested. And if it is, it's only for one thing. How much does it attract for this one animal? But what about all the other benefits that we know um, you know, have been chosen about? I mean, I always think that people choose what cultivars and nativars look like. Okay, but evolution, wildlife and pollinators, they're the ones that chose what the true species look like. So if you can't avoid these things, and again, unless there's a reason to do it, leave the plant stems up there, leave them standing. Don't be as, don't be as neat about cleaning up or so, so forth, because when you clean up, you sometimes are throwing away a lot of these, um, a lot of the, uh, of the things that are, that are trying to uh, overwinter in your plants and so forth. And again, the final thing is go native, which is the, the basic, argument here about the whole presentation. So let's look at bees for a second. And I, I know people have heard about host plants, but here's something that maybe a lot of people have not heard about. And this is uh, some of the some of the examples or whatever of, uh, you know, uh, th that we see from Sam Drogi. And again, they, they realize that 20 uh, percent of the 450 or so species that we have here. There's about 450 or so species in Virginia, about 450 or so species in Maryland. But many of these are specialists. They can visit more than one flower, but they need the pollen from specific plants in order to reproduce. So guess what? These are illegal lectic bees. They need these flowers. And if you don't have them, you don't have this bee, okay? And again, you, there's an example of many of them on the right-hand side. When you plant these things, there are certain species of, of bees that have to have them. And when you don't have them, guess what? You're not feeding 20% uh, of the 450 or so native species that we have. So folks, um, j just another reason that uh, when people think about host plants, they think of only caterpillars, which is great, but there are also lots of host plants if you can think, uh, think about that are actually benefiting um, certain species of bees. If you don't have this, then you don't have the bee species either. So about 70% of the bees nest underground, and that's something we have to realize. Um, uh, and about 30% are, are um, nest in, in some kind of cavity. 
Um, 90 percent of the of the of the 20,000 or so species worldwide are solitary. Most bees that you have live by themselves, okay? And that's a big difference, of course, from what most people think about with honeybees. Now, honeybees, you got a queen and you got all these workers and so forth, but that's not the case with uh, with most of these bees. Most of these bees, it's a solitary bee. He's the he's the provider. He's the egg layer. He's the one that guards everything. They all, it's a it's a solitary thing. They all have to work on together, okay? And when we put up different kinds of uh, of of bee tubes and things like that with bee nesting structures, which is now a very popular thing to do. And if you want to, I do have a great blog on, on bee nesting structures if you want to look up the Captain Latros blog. But uh, I stopped doing this for one big reason, and, it, and that is that at the very end of all of it, I ended up um, attracting a ton of the species on the, on the right hand side, a lot of these Japanese hornbees. And it's great, they're pollinators. But they compete directly with the left-hand side, the uh, the blue orchard mason bee, our real type of a, a real type of uh, our native pollinator, and that's very very important um, because we do need um, we need to support the native as much as we can. But that's um, but sometimes that doesn't happen because non-natives take advantage of the um, uh, take advantage of these kinds of of plants. So I stopped doing it because it's it. it I found that that it really supported the non-native ones, but at the expense of our native mason bees and so forth. Now, a quick example of how many of the solitary bees work, an example of the mason bees, they collect a ton of pollen and nectar, put it up in a little ball, um, and then they lay their egg, as you see on the right-hand side, that is what they lay inside the nest. And out of there comes out the baby, they seal it off with, uh, with a, a layer of mud, that's thus the, thus the name mason bee. And it's pretty neat. When they start doing it, they put all of the females in the back um, and they can choose which ones are females and, and males when they lay them. And at the very front, they end up laying male eggs. And the last little section, they leave completely empty. So if somebody comes around, for example, a, a woodpecker and he pecks on it, the, and he may realize, oh, there's nothing here because the first thing is empty. But if he continues going through there, okay, he starts feeding on the male bees. And that's okay because guess what? You don't need a ton of male bees. It, you you know you can have one very happy male bee and tons of females. And so there is there is some science to this of having very very deep uh, cavities because you produce a ton of of um, a ton of females, which is what you need to to support the population. And again, a very fascinating type of thing. But here's here's a um, you know here's how many of the solitary bees kind of work. And when one problem, though, when you put a lot of these things together is that, again, they are connected to other parts of nature. So, for example, on the top left, here is a typical bee nesting structure for mason bees. And you notice many of them have been are been dug up. Why? Because woodpeckers feed on them. So, folks, you have to understand when you ton, put a ton of solitary bees and you put them all together, you're you're basically ringing the dinner bell for other types of things. That doesn't just include uh, woodpeckers, but on the top here, you see a chalcid wasp. Um, on on the, the middle one, you see actually uh, pollen mites, which bees pick up and again, or can concentrate on them. And you see another kind of ch uh, chalcid wasp, a leucospis, and it's pretty neat types of stuff. So when you put these things together, you're attracting a lot of parasites and par predators, okay? And that's, you know, that's just the interconnectedness of how all these things work. And there are some other things to depend on these. These are actually cuckoo bees, okay? The one on the left feeds on cavity nesters. So he goes after mason bees. And the one on the right is one that feeds on ground nesting solitary bees. And what these guys do, but like the idea of a cuckoo is they lay their eggs inside another bee's nest. And then the, the bee that, that comes out feeds on the pollen that's been gathered for the other one and will kill and eat whatever, um, whatever the original owner's uh, owner's B was. And so this happens and these are very cool. They're actually very, very armored. So in case the, the, the mom comes back and sees that there's somebody doing it, he can withstand some of these things when he tries to get, you know, beat a hasty retreat. But again, when you plant these things, it's pretty neat. You're attracting a ton of other things. They're all interconnected and it starts, starts with the mason bees and everything else that depends on them. So here are other things. You put up these things maybe to attract um, bees, but you find out that you can attract several other things. On the left, you have a solitary wasp. Um, and then in the middle, you have uh, 
you have leaf cutter bees that will sometimes use them as well. And on the right are grass carrying wasps. So you can see why they're called grass carrying wasps because guess what? They use grass instead of uh, mud to put in there. And again, these are competitors, but they're also taking advantage of that, that niche. You're providing uh, something like a, a cavity and these animals uh, you know, will take advantage of it. And that's okay in many ways, okay? Because um, you're doing one thing and you're helping many other things at the time. May have, you may have wanted mason bees, but there is a lot of things that you also um, will attract. So here we go on to something else, and this is myrmecocri. This is seed dispersal by ants. And guess what, folks? We're in a part of the country where it happens a lot. Here's just an example. Of, of the many kinds of Myrmecocorus plants that we have. About 30% of our spring blooming plants depend on ants to take, uh, to take the seed from one place to another. They eat the eliasome, what they're looking for in, in the seed. Um, like right here, which is, you can see that the, that the bees are pulling that off to feed on. But in reality, they take the seed to a new place further away, oftentimes in ant dumps, which really are full of organic materials that the, that the ants don't care about. They now have the, the ants guarding them. And so um, they really need the ants. And we're in one of the hot spots of the world for myrmecocorus plants. And again, you can just see a whole example of many of the different kinds of plants, uh, spring blooming plants that really depend on ants. And it's not any kind of ant, it's certain species of ant, but again, it shows you how interconnected everything is. And ants are connected to many other things. Uh, many gardeners have gone out there and they found out, oh, what's going on? You see these ants and a lot of insects that they feed on, what they call ant cows. Many of them are things like uh, are aphids or tree hoppers, like on the right. But again, um, they benefit because um, the ants protect them from any other kind of predator and they stroke them. And what the ant cows do is they actually feed them. They, they produce, uh, they produce um, uh, something that's very beneficial to the ants. Again, some interconnectedness of how these different things are, uh, go together. And again, another great natural is Aldo Leopold. The first rule of intelligent tickering, don't lose any of the pieces. And this is unfortunately what we, what's been happening. And a lot of times it happens because we either don't, you know, we construct over place and we don't realize the interconnectedness. And so we don't plant a lot of these native plants. We, we disrupted them. And it also happens when we add something. We add a new thing, a non-native that sometimes becomes an invasive. And these invasive plants weren't part of the puzzle. And here's the thing. We all know that you want to build the puzzle, but you can't build the puzzle if you lose the pieces. And you also can't build the puzzle if you take a perfectly good piece of puzzle from another place, an invasive, stick it in there. And guess what, folks? What you're doing now is other things don't fit in the puzzle, okay? Everything's interconnectedness, but that means that you can't have extra pieces that then disrupt the ones that are supposed to be there. So just some examples of different kinds of uh, different kinds of things. These are some examples of galls and galls are pretty neat. They're, it, they, it's basically an edible home. They live inside the plant. And again, they're not really that harmful. They, they may not look like something that you really might want in there. But you got to remember, most of these are very host specific. And so um, it's, a, as I mentioned before, a very poor evolutionary strategy to kill the only thing that you need to survive. And so again, um, if you do see a gall or whatever in your plant, most of them are not harmful for the plant. They may not look all, all that great, but they're very, very important and they feed other things. And so folks, a galls are not a bad thing. It's just something else uh, that, 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 uh, that connects to the plant that you may have planted. And again, we mentioned invasives. Here's an example of how this kind of happens. Um, we have something in West Virginia white, and it's a beautiful little white butterfly, not the cabbage white we see flying all over the place. But in reality, it's one that's very low flying, lives in the woods, comes up one time. And what it's looking for are tooth warts. And what butterflies do is they land on there, they drum, they take their front legs, um, beat on the plant. And when they taste just the right thing, in this case, it's looking for mustard. So boom, 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 bams. Uh, uh, drums its legs, oh, it's a mustard, and he lays on a tooth wart. The bad news is garlic mustard, which spreads so much further, it also is a mustard. So when the West Virginia white taps on the, on the garlic mustard, oh, it's a mustard, lays its eggs, but it's a wrong host plant. And so 
garlic mustard, unfortunately, is killing off the West Virginia whites because it grows so much more. It also has a bun of, bunch of other things. It doesn't just compete with them, but it has some um, allelopathic pro properties to it. It actually keeps other kinds of plants from germinating. So again, this is an extra piece to the puzzle, which is fatal to many of the existing things in the puzzle. You don't want to add extra pieces, okay? And you definitely don't want something which is invasive, which is what happens with garlic mustard. So again, some of these keystone plants, let's look at goldenrod, which we might want to plant for some beautiful fall color, but it's got so many other benefits. It feeds a ton of birds, a ton of mammals, a ton of other kinds of things. And again, for bees, there are 11 species of bees that have to have goldenrod or they don't exist. And 115 different kinds of caterpillars feed on it that then, as I mentioned, feed 96% of the birds and pretty much all of our bats. And there's tons of beetles. Again, this is one of those plants that you may plant it because you like the, the beauty of, of this fall color, but in reality, you're benefiting so much more. The same can be said of asters, another plant that we may want to plant for fall types of look, a uh, fall type of look, but guess what? A ton of other things benefit from it, from it whether it's birds or whether it's 109, uh, 109 or so different kinds of caterpillars. Uh, there's a ton of bees that also need it, including eight of them, which have to have aster pollen or they don't exist. And again, there's a ton to choose from, 38 different species in Virginia alone. So folks, this is important to realize. Um, you may plant it for one reason, but in reality, you're helping a lot more. And the same can be said, for example, of, of something like wild strawberries. We have wild strawberries. I have in my yard. If you look over here, this is, this is actually my driveway. And growing in the cracks along the driveway, what do I have? I have native strawberries. I like them because they're fantastic eating. But guess what? I'm not the only things to eat them. There's 81 caterpillars to feed on it. There's 53 birds and at least one bee that has to have the pollen or it will not be able um, to reproduce. And so again, uh, it's kind of important to realize you may plant it for one reason, but in reality, it's actually, um, it's actually benefiting so much more. Now there is an invasive, okay, an Indian strawberry that looks like it. Um, and you can tell the difference because they have yellow flowers and unlike strawberries where the stuff is embedded into the, into the skin, um, the Indian strawberry is, is, is something that, uh, uh, that actually uh, has the, the seeds uh, put on there. And so unfortunately the Indian strawberry is now becoming very invasive, but if you plant the right strawberry, the wild strawberry for Garia virginiana, it is a wonderful plant that's both edible and provides a lot of other beneficial values as well. Another one that, of course, as I mentioned earlier, I have planted is June berries, service berries. Um, they're fantastic. Over 42 birds feed on it, 124 different caterpillars, 24 different kinds of mammals, and it's beautiful to look at. Again, you can see here in my tiny little yard, I have a, I have a, a, running, uh, a running service berry, and look, I was able to collect a ton of great fruit. So again, you may plant it for the beauty that it provides, but you can also plant something that's also beneficial to so many other types of things. And then we, we, have, uh, we, we have not mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, we have not mentioned, for example, um, things that, which are specifically um, made uh, for other types of things. In this case, these are hummingbird plants and hummingbird plants are different. I mentioned red was not a great color for most insects because other than, for example, the zebra swallowtails, uh, I'm sorry, the spice bush swallowtails, many of them don't see the color red. But if they're long and tubular, uh, and oftentimes they don't have a scent, they're often pollinated by hummingbirds. And again, here are some examples of the many different things that feed on them. But here's the thing though, you may, have, you may want to plant some of these because you're, uh, you want to attract hummingbirds, but in reality, they feed so much more. So look at the bottom right, one of my favorite ones that I have in my yard, the trumpet or the coral honeysuckle. Yes, I plant it because it's got a great long bloom time. It blooms for like three months in my yard. There's always flowers on it, which is great for the hummingbirds. But guess what? There are 37 other kinds of caterpillars to feed on it. And why is that beneficial? Because I know that those caterpillars then feed something else. It turns out, by the way, that hummingbirds, yes, you plant, uh, you plant these things and you assume that they just feed on nectar, but nectar is very poor food source for their young. And so it turns out that while they're, that while they're nesting, they feed on a ton of insects that they bring back to feed their young. So indirectly, a lot of these plants are also supporting the hummingbirds in a different way. 
All right. And so, folks, uh, again, what I'm trying to say is um, you want to plant native and you may plant it for one reason. But in reality, there's so many other beneficial things to look at. And again, I've gone over some very, very few examples of this. But the whole idea is, folks, when you have a choice, please plant a native plant. You can choose from a variety of different ones that are out there. You got to get the right plant for the right place that you want to grow this. But in the end, you are benefiting a lot of your wild neighbors at the same time, most of which you don't see are unobtrusive. You'd never notice, for example, the 557 different kinds of caterpillars on an oak tree. They're good at hiding. Why? Because if they're not, a bird eats them, <laughs> which is the way that they, you know, is, is what the bird wants. But here's the thing. Um, most insects and, and most things on there are incredibly hard to see. And that's beneficial to them because they don't want to be seen because they get eaten. So you plant these things. Oh, there's tons of different uh, things to feed on it. But most of them are not going to hurt the plant because they evolve with them. So folks, again, um, I, I'll be happy to take uh, questions for the, 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 uh, the, the remainder of the time. But and otherwise, I, I do encourage you, if you want to, to go ahead and, uh, and check out my Capital Naturalist. Um, you know, social media avenues. But again, folks, if you have some questions or something like that, I'll be happy to uh, to answer them. So Alonzo, we have a few in the chat box that were not answered. Okay, go ahead and ask them if you don't mind. Or, or okay. yeah. Are, are honeybees a threat to native bees? Okay, so honeybees were introduced, I believe, in, in 1629 in, in, Williams, uh, in Williamsburg, okay? So they've been here for a long time. And here, they're generalists. And there's been some studies to say that they do compete, and this, this is the truth, as they're generalists, they're not as picky about what things they're going to go. And so they may compete with some types of species of things which are very specific and need, for example, the illegal electric bees. They need this. The honeybees can feed on something else, but mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the native bee needs this, uh, this particular uh, plant. Um, so the other things is nobody has looked at, at what kind of uh, damage they may have done in, in the, you know, in the hundreds of years that they've been here. So um, we may not know because many of those things have already disappeared, but some people do think that certain species of bees are, um, are competitors with honeybees and with, uh, and is, so uh, for some, it may be the case that they are competing with the native bees. Okay, thanks. So another question is, um, I have a service berry and it has that seed oh. rest on it, does that affect uh, native insects? It does not. And, and again, that's one of those things. This, the cedar apple rust or the hawthorn apple rust, that will affect it. Um, you know, if, if you have cedars and this kind of thing nearby. And, and again, uh, in, in my yard, it does happen. It happens more in wet years than others. Um, the fruits are not as good for other animals to eat once they, they turn into what I guess mummy berries or whatever you want to call those things. They're not that uh, appetizing to even birds. But, um, but as far as other things, the, the caterpillars aren't feeding so much on the fruit, okay? It's still providing a ton of leaves to benefit the caterpillars to feed on there that then, of course, feeds birds and bats. And the flowers are still producing pollen and nectar for the bees that come visit it. So from a wildlife standpoint, um, it's still very beneficial and, and provides tons of great types of things. But unfortunately for me, I hate when they get the, the cedar apple rust because that means I have fewer berries that I can eat and I guess other birds and stuff can eat as well. Okay. If you don't put up a structure for solitary bees, what else can you do for them besides native plants? <laughs> well, there is so many, yeah, besides any, there are so many different things. And again, you have 450 different species of bees. And so there's a ton of different things that you can do. For example, I, I said, don't clean up your yard so much. Certain types of flowers, for example, elderberries, this kind of stuff are really good at hosting, uh, at hosting mason bees and other uh, cavity nesting bees. And many things live on the, on the stems themselves. So again, in this, if you want to clean up in the springtime or whatever, leaves as much standing as you can. Can. And especially um, if you can uh, trim your plants so that they're maybe a foot high or so and put, you know, bundle up what's left and put it over in a corner. Guess what? That standing little piece will still host a lot of bees that are over nesting inside the, ne inside the thing itself. And folks, here's another thing. If there are bees that are in the ground, solitary bees around there, um, 
uh, that's a good thing. And you don't want to alter that. Um, and, and I've seen people that, oh, I don't like this bear patch and, and so forth. But guess what? Bear patches, believe it or not, are great places for bees to nest. And so if you do know that bees are using a, a, a place, don't try to change it because they're already benefiting, uh, benefiting from it. So there's lots of things that you can do, not just the native plants, but don't be so neat about taking care of your garden because what you leave over is, uh, can provide great places for caterpillars and bees to overwinter as well. There's a question about finding certain, which plants uh, work better together. Yeah, lots of That's things work broad. better. Yeah, yeah, lots of things work better together and some things don't work so well together. And we, we mentioned the service berry. You know, if you have cedars right near your service berry or apple trees or whatever the case may be, then, you know, that is, that it, it does, it, it acts as an alternate host for, uh, for that type of thing. But lots of things do, uh, do go well together. There is a lot of different thing, uh, different ideas about companion planting. Um, some of this I am not as familiar with, but people have done some studies on companion planting. Okay, you plant this, and what it does, uh, for example, uh, things in the in, in the onion family and things like that. And we do have, believe it or not, lots of really cool native native onions. Some of them are really beautiful. Um, but you plant these, and one, they're uh, they're not as tasty to things like deer or rabbits, but they also some say uh, will keep away some of the harmful. Um, some of the harmful types of, uh, of things that may affect other things in your garden. The other thing that people often uh, like to plant are things like um, composite, uh, especially uh, mints. You plant mints and you have to be careful because mints spread like mints, okay, they spread very quickly. Um, but if you plant it in just the right place, um, it attracts a ton of different kinds of wasps and the wasps come to feed on the, the you know, to, to help pollinate and feed on the flowers. But at the same time, many of these wasps also will uh, come in and, and, uh, and feed on some of the other animals that perhaps you're not as crazy in, in your garden. So they'll come through and they, uh, they'll get some of the caterpillars, things like that, whatever the case may be. So that's an example, I guess, of some different kinds of companion planting. Okay, I, I'm assuming we still have a time for some questions. Um, there was a question about the um, what, chestnuts and the res disease resistant varieties. What do you think? Yeah, so so we uh, I experimented along with Earth Sangha and, and and Rod Simmons with with planting some um some ch uh, chestnuts, American chestnuts that actually had lived long enough to produce what we were thinking might be some um they they seem to survive long enough to produce fruits and so forth. We planted those different kinds of fruits and and I will say it's amazing. Um, there are tons of things that feed on chestnuts, by the way, but um, but I will say though. Um, the ones that we have, we have now a something, it's, I guess it's like 14 feet tall chestnut of one of these things that we hope is resistant. It has yet to produce, uh, to produce any kinds of seeds, but there's no sign of any kind of, of, of rust on it um, or the blight, I should say, on it. Um, so I think that if you, if you breed, if you breed or, or look for these resistant types of plants, I think is much better. I am not crazy about when we start to engineer um, mixing them with non-native plants and so forth, because we also don't know how that affects some of the other animals that may or that may may have been feeding on it, which was a ton. So I know there's some things out there. Uh, I think they're. Uh, I I'm not crazy about mixing it with non-natives to get something that you need. Um, but I will say um, people are finding more resistant types of things that I'm hoping that, uh, and someday we will probably never return it to what it, the majesty of what it used to be, but we will return it in some form that it will, uh, that will still support wildlife and, and, uh, and so forth sometime in the future. Okay, um, preventing spider mites is something. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you wanna answer that. Yeah. Uh, mainly it's usually the right plant you know yeah right plant right place that's 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 the thing don't fight nature work with it i mean you know if you're trying to fight it you have a long uphill battle but you can find what things would survive and whatever types of of, of things you have and oftentimes it's native plants because they evolved in some of some of these very similar conditions okay um Nancy, I have a couple of questions. Okay, please take over. <laughs> so this was, these are in the chat. We had a couple um, people ask about treating uh, diseases on trees, such as dogwood anthracnose or the American um, boxwood blight, and um, how that might, uh, are there are good, 
should they be spraying and are these dangerous to other um, types of critters? Yeah, so this is a tricky one because again, you, you want, you want, of course, for the for the tree to do well, and unfortunately, many of these blights, and and, and again, many of them are, are invasive. They came over. So, for example, dogwood blight probably came over on the Kusa dogwoods, where we introduced another plant that is resistant to it, but to the the great, uh, you know, but unfortunately, it's very bad for egg flowering dogwoods. Um, I do know that um, you know, people are trying to do it. And there are some things that you can do as far as uh, you know, having the plant in an open type of area. Uh, this kind of stuff will help reduce uh, reduce the um, the blight that's there, but unfortunately, you have to remember like dogwoods. They, they have what I guess is foliar flagging. Uh, the fruits are red, and then it's a small tree, so the leaves turn red at the same time. It's easy for birds to see this small tree and its berries a long way because the, it, it's flagging the the birds with with both its um with both its berries and and the fall foliage. So a bird lands on it, and of course picks up uh, eat, feeding on 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 the birds. And I think it's over a hundred hundred a hundred different kinds of birds that. Feed on dogwood berries, um, uh, well, not berries, uh, but on, on fruits of, of dogwoods, okay? Um, and so they spread it from one place to another. But I mean, some people, uh, it, it's unfortunate. I, I've seen how some of this stuff affects it. Um, I, I don't have any good, um, any good uh, advice about what you can do other than, you know, grow it in, in an area where where you can um, where you can do this and, and try to remove if you see any infected types of stuff. But oftentimes, once it's in there, it's already you, you what when you notice it, it's usually too late. It's already inside the tree itself. Thank you, Alonzo. Um, I think we have room for maybe one more question. Uh, there is uh, this is an interesting one where someone has five acres of American beech forest and they've mm. spent the last two years clearing it of invasives, but they want to know with all that work, how do they know if they're being successful? Should they look for some particular plant indicators coming back into that area? Yeah, so a couple of things. So beach beach is very beneficial. Now, um, it, ours don't don't uh, produce as much fruits. No, the, the beech nuts are not as much as as far as further up north. But beech is resistant to certain things, and which is great. Like like uh, for example, deer. But unfortunately, the problem is that um, you might these things might might be great, but. Um, there, there is a problem. So for example, we've noticed that, for example, when we clear an area of invasives, um, we've opened it up for other types of things. And so, um, for example, deer. So the deer don't like the beach and you've removed the invasives. So what are they feeding on? They're feeding on the natives, which you're trying to encourage. And it's kind of tricky because you kind of need to control the deer um, because otherwise they're feeding on the native plants, which they preferred anyways. You've made it easier because you've cleared out the things that you don't want. They don't prefer the beach itself as far as eating. So um, it, it, it's a difficult type of thing, but you do want to see what kinds of things are growing there and encourage them. You may want, you might even have to, you know, fence them off so that they don't get eaten by deer. But um, when you see a ton of these other types of plants growing there, the, the biodiversity is what you want to see. The more bi the biodiversity that you have, not just beaches, but many other things, that encourages and feeds so many other kinds of plants. So um, you want to look for biodiversity. Go through there, go, go with, with someone who perhaps know the plants and things like that. And um, when you find them, say, oh, this is good. You want to encourage as much new growth of things other than beach in that same area. And there's some neat ones. And if, if you encourage them, you're supporting a ton of other types of wildlife. So you want to look for biodiversity and then what it, and then that will feed other types of things. All right, Alonso, thank you very much. You've given everyone a lot of really good information to think about. And our, our, we appreciate very much for you um, coming in here. And uh, if you can hang around, uh, that would be great. We're going to now um, go back to Rob and he will transition us into our breakout sessions. All right, so thank you, Julie. Um, so I, I will say that I've done my best uh, to pre-assign people to breakout rooms. Uh, so I'm going to open the rooms. And what you should see if you're pre-assigned is it will just ask you to join. Uh, if you have not been pre-assigned, if you want to change breakout rooms, uh, you should have a button in the bottom of your Zoom screen that says more. Uh, and once the breakout rooms are open, uh, you can just choose which one you want to go into. Uh, I will say again, Let's see. Uh, 